think that it cheats. So I'm going to blow that guy away. You can imagine, like, I didn't really actually let that guy finish. Oh, and here's another one I pushed out here. This is a host name update guy. It just pushed a layer. So if you mentioned incremental, all this guy to update that one that just has a host name change, or it's just a little incremental push, and it just pushed it up there. So they're built off the image. So the nice part is when you start working across the WANs, you can imagine you can have, like, the local big image cache. And then you can push your little micro images around. It's a lot easier. So you start from a known. So you can imagine down the road, rel seven comes out, right? And you have a certified rel seven image in var lib docker or whatever there. And then all you do is when you pull down from your local registry server, it'll say, oh, there's a certified version of rel already on the box. I don't have to pull that big honking guy. I'll just pull the small changes for your one. And so you can start to do this like distributed computing thing where you don't have, you know, all of the guys will have their local copy of themselves essentially, but they won't. You don't want to pull a big amount of data down. And then I'll quickly show you really quickly. Um, so I want to show you guys this guy. So, so I won't go through that much. So, so another thing that I didn't talk about was Relatomic. So Relatomic, so Software Collections, Doctor Relatomic are all, so Gartner's calling this paste layer development. So like you can imagine like Facebook and Google release it every single day, right? Like my buddy was saying when I said it's like 40,000 releases a day. So I mean, you can imagine with all the different products, that's how many releases there are per day. I mean, you know, so there's a ton. Any, any corporate, any company that I would ever work for never releases that many. I mean, we're, we're, we're looking at more like, you know, once, you know, an application life cycle. So they're like, oh, in three months we'll release the doc, whatever version of it. You know, that kind of mentality. Obviously, that's, those are the two extremes, right? There's the, there's the hey, we're going to release the 6.0 version, and it's going to be around for 10 years. You know, and then when we create 6.1, you know, maybe three months into it, you know, or whatever, that one will, you know, or the major version one will live in 10 years, the minor versions may live, you know, some smaller now, like six months to three years. With SEO and Atomic, what, what Red Hat's trying to do is target the mid-range development. So like mobile sites, microsites, marketing sites, a lot of those like shorter term web apps that are developed may be good for like two to five years. And so there's this middle ground where like RHEL is supported for almost 13 years now, you know, depending on how you look at it, 10 to 13 years. Um, you know, and Facebook supports the version of Facebook that's run on your, like when you bring it up in your browser for like a day. I mean, literally less than a day. I mean, it'll be a different version of that app like two minutes later when another release comes out. So you can imagine that's a totally different mentality, right? There's stuff in between that we're trying to target that a lot of normal people need to do. Like, not everybody can release every three seconds. So um, the idea is that those versions, they don't care. Like, if there's a dependency, they'll just push a different dependency. They don't care. Whereas, like, a lot of people do care about controlling those dependencies. Like, we built up all this ITIL stuff. I don't know if you guys know about ITIL, but there's all these change management processes that people develop for, for, I hate to say it, but for the average people. Like, I mean, people that just don't want to deal with, like, you know, really hard problems all the time just to get the latest greatest. Like, a microsite might make, you know, I don't know, First Energy a little bit of money, but it's not going to make them a ton of money. You know, it's not like Google.com or Facebook.com where that is their business. So Docker's one way, right? You can let those Docker images can be certified and run for, you know, the same amount of time as RHEL. That's pretty cool. But you can come with your own core builds that certify those for, say, three to five years internally as a product that you deliver to your internal people. That's one thing. Software Collections is a layered channel that RHEL, Red Hat provides. And what's in Software Collections is newer versions of Ruby, newer versions of Python, Perl, MySQL, MariaDB, Nginx, Apache, all, uh, all these different things that people are, Node.js, all these sort of like trendy hipster cool programming things that are, but they do need to be supported for like three to five years because if you build something in Node.js, they're probably going to want to change it soon, but they want it, they want it to at least, like once the developer's done with the microsite, just keep patching it in case Heartbleed comes out and breaks it, but I'm off next to the next project. I don't really care. I just want this thing to live for about three years and maybe three years from now, we'll come back and rebuild the microsite or rebuild the mobile app or whatever, but it needs to provide, you know, whoever value that you built it for for a short amount of time. Software Collections is these newer versions that are supported for three years under RHEL, they're an overlay channel. They are not supported for the full 10 year life cycle. But the cool part is when they are supported for three years and they overlap, so they're released every 18 months and they're supported for three years. So you, you get multiple versions of these software collections. So we're at like 1.1 and 2.0s in beta right now. 1.1 and 2.0 will also be supported on RHEL 7. So this blow, if people that have done 
operating system stuff for a while. This blows. This blew my mind because now when I have some trendy Ruby developer like Chad working on, you know, he needs Ruby 2.0, which is coming out. 2.1 actually. Yeah, fine. 2.0. I thought it was 2.0. 2.1.1. 2.1.1. You're a fan. So 2.0 is. Yeah, but that, that's not stable. 2.0 oh, is not stable. Is it really? Yeah. They use odd numbers for stability. They don't know how to do software. <laughs> They're Japanese. Oh, they just don't know. <laughs> so so uh, when you need like 2.0 or 1.9, are you guys using 1.9? Don't try and act all cool. Oh, we use 2.1.1. Oh, no, <laughs> really? See, there you go. The so products some products will have 1.9, some will have 2. But you want to rip out RHEL 6, put RHEL 7 underneath it? No problem. As long as software collections 2.0 runs on it, you've you know, made the operating system interchangeable. You're no, no longer relying on the internally built old ass Ruby or old ass you know Python to, to do that. So now you have a latest great version that gets patched. So when the heartbleed of Ruby comes out, which will definitely happen because Ruby's terrible. <laughs> so it will have that happen eventually. And when that does happen, you'll actually be able to get a release from Red Hat that fixes it without breaking your whole ass. So it's kind of cool. Um, <coughs> and then well, Atomic is a complete rethink of Yum and RPM. So instead of releasing entire you know, you know, you can imagine when you do a Yum update on Thursday, it's different than when you do it on Friday. It's never the same. Like any given day that you do it on, it's different. So you might go from, you know, hey, I updated last Thursday, I'm updating this Thursday, to hey, I updated two Thursdays ago, and I'm updating this Thursday. Those are different transactions if you really think about it. That is not the same thing. And there's an infinite number of permutations that you can have because every customer on the planet updates at different times. So they have their own quarterly release cycle, et cetera, et cetera. And people don't like that, honestly, because there's a lot of risk because you might, you might go to update something and it's just a hair different than the ways, you know, when you do it from last Thursday versus two Thursdays ago, you know, Ruby jumped two verse instead of one, you know, or whatever. And so it's just different and it creates risk. So what they're gonna do is do what are called RPM OS tree snapshots. And so you will literally build a snapshot between two known good values that we've already ran through the paces and tested. And they'll both be able to live in hardlink on the OS at the same time. And you'll literally run one command to jump forward or backward. So like you will no longer build a, when you if you have to update last Thursday, this Thursday, or next Thursday, it will all be one snapshot that was this you know that will just create new snapshots. And so Relatomic will update in chunks as opposed to like infinitely permutable you know versions of updates, which a lot of people don't want, especially like whatever your underlying container guy is, like CoreOS style container, which is what Relatomic targets. Yeah is you want that guy to just jump from like known good value to known good value and I want to be able to do it like like instantaneously. You know? So basically it'll it'll sync this OS snapshot down and then apply it and then you're like, oh stuff's broken, roll back to the last version and it's back. So and it uses hard links to the OS, you know, in the file system to do that. So that's a completely different mentality. But again supporting that mid range idea that, that a lot of these will be Docker containers, a lot of them will not necessarily be full OSs, they'll be applications and I just need to update certain things. If you just need to update a certain thing in a doc, you might still use yum to like just update SSL. But but if you want to update the underlying thing that you will break your cloud essentially, you know, you want that guy to be really stable. So you go from OS snapshot to OS snapshot basically. Is that something that you think will be in CentOS? Is that, is that a rel only thing? I don't know because that is almost more part of the infrastructure than the actual OS. But I suspect there will be a special interest group for that to create something like that. You know, that's one of those things where I'd say play in the play in the community and ask around because that is something interesting. Yeah. I don't know how Fedora is doing it. That's another thing I look at is how Fedora is doing it. I literally this is so brand new. It is like we're talking like hot off the presses. Like they released basically all the stuff at Summit. So a lot of it I don't know how it's going to play out in the community yet. But uh, that that's an interesting question. Admittedly, I don't know because there's a lot of work to building it that way. Mm -hmm. That's essentially the metadata around the OS as opposed to like the actual OS. So, um, so how how would let's say network admins and sysadmins package their tools to be consistent? Because tool different tools could be in very different uh, stages. How would they do it containerizing? So that's what I'm so that's what I'm getting ready to dive into. So check this guy out. This slide to me is like this is what one that blew my mind. So so. The whole idea of the feature is that these types of things will be shared services that live on one OS. So this guy right here is an OS. Gear D controls controls really like this. This there's another layer that they're not showing here. Actually, System D should be like this should really say System D, uh, even though this this is kind of wacky. It's done. System D will control these guys right inside of an OS instance. Gear D will will control even higher level than that. Docker and System D will live in the OS. 
and you'll fire up a container for identity services. You'll fire up a container that has your NPRE, you know, Nadia stuff in it. You'll fire up another container that has SSH that provides you SSH to the whole OS instance. You'll fire up Cockpit, which is the open LMI front end. We, we wrote a web end, like a web 2.0 GUI that's pretty cool that, that, that can essentially manage a rel instance. And it's compatible with the window, the win, WinMI or whatever. I figure like WMI or whatever the hell it's called. WMI is oh, yeah. the Windows crap. WMI CMT or whatever the hell it's called. <laughs> but it's a standard for how you like, you know, extend a file system or how you, you know, add a CPU, delete a CPU, you know, change uh, a user, add a user, delete a user. All these like basic things that you do to an OS. There's a standard for that that Microsoft actually adhered to, and so now they're they're actually doing that in Linux. So RHEL 7 will comply with that, and then Cockpit will be a front end that sits in front of that. But you only kind of want one of those because those are like local manager type things, right? So those can live in a, in what we call shared services containers. And then, um, and then these these are your application containers. So so those shared services will provide you know things to these other <coughs> containers. You know, you, like you've got to SSH into the box, obviously manage containers, right? So this is kind of where I think. When all again, kind of metadata -y type stuff, like a lot of this is you're kind of relying on your vendor to provide the best way to do all this junk. So, you know, basically all I want is I want to be able to fire up Oracle in this thing. And I don't want to have to worry about how all this stuff works, you know what I mean? So, Red Hat, the idea is to get you to the point where you can just start up Oracle in this guy, and you can start up SAP in that guy, you know, and you can start up Apache in that guy, and Tomcat in that guy. And, and you know, everything else is shared services in the OS that basically provide value to, the, to those containers. So, so, so if you had a, a, a breach of some kind, uh, your incident response people would be yeah, just dump that container. The surface. Yeah, well, they would come in on the shared service, probably dump the container and say, "Give me a static shot of that container, and I'll go troubleshoot how the hell they got into this thing." Right. Yeah, and you can shut it down, and without destroying the OS, that's kind of cool. You know, and obviously, you can imagine Amazon and Rackspace and everybody else really wants stuff like this. I mean, every every hosting provider on the planet wants this because because you you need some way you can't destroy the OS the underlying OS instances that like how's your OpenStack or how's your whatever your cloud layer is you know Amazon's proprietary but there are hypervisors and there are management boxes and there are all these things that are really scary if they break you know so you want to go to like just you know you don't want to have to necessarily destroy a physical box every time so so a lot of a lot of this will help do that kind of thing. You know, Done something like this. I'm sure other people have done stuff like this. Oracle. Or grown. Who? Oracle. Oh, really? Yeah. In Linux or in Solaris? Oracle. Oh, you're saying inside of Oracle. Right. They, same idea where they spin up and it comes up like that. And that's the base of the service. Right. It was a bad joke that no one got, apparently. <laughs> Everything's as a service. <coughs> Last year, uh, Great Lakes uh, Oracle News Group, yeah. they had their conference at the beginning of the month. Um, Did, you Did you feel dirty after you left? Pardon? Did you feel dirty after you left? Sort of. But uh, I attended that last year, and that's one of the things they showed in Was comparison it? to uh, you know, doing a VMware or something. <coughs> So the magic of this is obviously that each one of those application containers is basically RHEL, certified RHEL, so it's a generic OS as opposed to like Oracle and all this type of stuff. So the dream state here is that every one of my apps will be able to run on this. The challenge I see right now with like Oracle and IBM is that their stacks are basically, oh, you want Cognos. Okay, we'll press this button, we'll fire up a VM with Cognos on it and you know have some environment variables and kind of change around for it. But now I have to have an IBM stack, an Oracle stack, a you know, whoever, SAP stack possibly, though thankfully they haven't done that yet. The idea is that this is a generic stack that can run all of your apps. Kind of the idea of an OS, right? Like the whole reason we had OSs in the first place is that we didn't want like specific versions of the OS for only that software. You know, because if you get to the scenario where it only works the Oracle stuff, now I'm basically running a database on this, on this via virtual machine or on this bare metal as opposed to running an OS which can run multiple things and, you know, can have the same OS, you know. So it's like, you know, frozen pizza versus how much of it do I doctor, you know. You know. So, yeah, I, cause I've seen this coming down the road a bit too, at least in the, in the cloud space, not necessarily within the OS, but, but trying to create like the software, like think software centered, you know, 
I want IBM Cognos, I want database, just press a button and it comes up. But really it's a whole OS with like the software already buried in it, kind of like basically just a big image that fires up. That's not really, that's not what Amazon does, I can tell you that. Amazon, you know, they, they use up every piece of resource, you know. They're running multiple different workloads on every single physical box. You know, they're, not, they're running every kind of workload. Now, mind you, they don't give you certified SAP inside of Amazon. I mean, it's too hard, you know. But the idea is that this might be able to do that, that middle ground, where you can have certified images inside of these, you know, or a certified way of building, for example, SAP inside of one of those things and still run it, you know, as, a, as essentially a, a, a controllable thing, you know, like because a Docker image is really easy to deal with, like I showed you. you can, Delete them, you can branch them, you can do all these magical things to do dips between them. So that's kind of the vision. And then I just kind of put some of the other interesting things, Atomic, Gear D, Docker, System D, Intel Informant, because they show satellite on the side here, it'll be able to provide these RPM OS trees, these OS tree host image updates, so it'll be able to provide that, RPMs, and puppet modules. So it'll have all three. They're all just different types of content. It's basically a infrastructure content management system, Satellite 6. So it'll be able to do all kinds of magical things. So you'll be able to promote like a set of RPM OS trees and puppet modules through dev, stage, test, and prod. We, we create application life cycles inside of Satellite. You can simply promote content between these different environments. And so it, it's a way for you to like, abstract that even another layer and say, oh, well, I want to synchronize all this stuff to a local library, play with it, and then promote it to dev, test with all these systems, promote it to stage, promote it to prod, and bandwidth it everywhere. So it's, it's pretty interesting to see kind of the big picture where it's going. So, any questions? All that stuff makes sense? Well, I've got a question, because I don't understand. But <laughs> let, let me ask you if, if my conception here is right. Okay, you got this registry. So it's like a, a repository for different customized kernels, but it's not actually the customized kernels, right? It's There's no kernel actually. Parameters for each customized kernel. And so engineer A wants to get, use this uh, set of parameters for to run what, whatever test or stuff he's going to do with uh, for uh, this particular kernel and. Uh, engineer B wants to uh, run a different set of parameters. Is this and the container that all these different parameters of, for the kernel are in? Are actually what what this mechanism is, is? It's a place to store all these different customized kernels, but they're not actually separate kernels. Because so when you showed the up, uh, you showed uh, you did a you did a you took one container and and changed it and it only increased by 0.737 uh, megabytes in size. So it, it can't be a, a different kernel. It's just like the, the parameters for the new customized kernel. So am I getting this right? So so I'll answer by saying, so So you see I'm logged in, oh here, can you see this? I'm logged in as rel4. I'm logged into a rel4 container basically. But if I do a uname, dash a, it's still running the same kernel. It's running a 2.6.32-431. That's a rel 6.5 kernel. So it's always the same kernel. It's never a different kernel. If you're talking about hardware or driver development, you still want to do virtualization and or bare metal. If you're talking about applications like databases and web servers and what I'm middleware, about then it works. I'm trying to understand the concept of these kernels. There's no kernels. There's one kernel. One kernel. There's one kernel. There's file systems that all run off that dip, that one kernel. It's not a virtual machine, it's only a container using the same original kernel. And then so each, each one you do after that is the diffs to the, <coughs> to the container you have Okay, before. yes, okay. So a full so virtualization, a, you would have a different copy of different kernels running on top in software on top of one kernel, which would then control the hardware. Okay. In, in Docker, you have one kernel running in memory, and it controls all these different file systems essentially, and user space applications that run inside of that one kernel. 
And there's they're really nothing more than processes. You're like CH rooting into another device, and basically. Exactly. I'm just an idiot. I like to stand up for a lot of my no if, if you do virtual machines, you have to assign like gigs of RAM and everything to get yeah. that started. You know, if you do these, yeah, yeah, okay, I understand. And each one, you can't have the first one. Just copy on. Yeah, you can resource restrict them too. So it's very efficient. Yeah, yeah. It's but it's also way to the same. Again, as long as you can stand group. having similar or the same yeah. restrictions. You're never going to run Windows on this. Yeah, no, 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 but you might be able to run Bluetooth and Debian and, 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 and Rel and Fedora all in the same way. Because they're close enough that if an ecosystem can form and everybody agrees on what that looks like, it can be done. So all the syscalls go back to the same time. And everything that's shared out of the ground has to be the same. You're really looking at the file system, but you've got a different view. You look at this union file system on top. So, for example, when you cat Etsy Red Hat release, it shows the file system out of a local union. With this particular so yes and no. You're, so I like actually didn't go into the I didn't go into the, the, go the deepest, darkest pieces. Of that so some of the files that Etsy hosts is actually from the underlying host. Yes. Yes. Some of the files are from the base image, and some of the files are from the layered image. So yeah, there's like three layers going on. Because like if I'm in here, watch this. You can't change Etsy hosts. Uh, what yeah. type is that? That means a kernel breaker. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know how they deal with that. Oh, let's see. Look at the syscall. No, it changes the host name. So Docker handles some of that stuff. But watch this. You can't you can't change etsyresolve.com. Like if I go to change this, it's read only. I can't change it because that's coming from the base file system, or 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 Docker provided. You know, because it could munch that, change it some way. But basically, it's just passing it through as is. But read only. So you can only do so much stuff inside those Docker containers. You're still considered root then, or are you considered another user since you can root? Would you root be able to write it as root, or is it kind of like a lesser privilege root when you go in there? I mean, I'm still root. But I mean, is it the same root though that is on the actual like main, main, uh, not container, but the main part? So I'd argue that what root means in 2013 doesn't mean the same as like 1990 because. Because with SE Linux groups, you're not necessarily root even though you are. Well, is this SE Linux applied though? Because I thought you said that's only in REL, REL 7 now. Yeah, well, REL 6 still has some of it. I don't know how much it's all working. But yeah, I mean, the dream state is that eventually you will have a different. I think I don't know. I'd love to see actually what these are. Do you think you come in Monday to that? I don't even know what these things look like because I've never actually looked through what these are. I see there is now C star. So let's do this. Uh, PS dash EFZ. <coughs> yeah, it doesn't look like it's going in national now, right now. But it will eventually. You see these unconfined, it's just running as unconfined. So there's nothing magical, you're right. Nothing magical going on with it right now. So you are basically uh, right into a read only file. Since you're not, it's not separated by SC Linux, I'm wondering if it's actually like some type of different like authentication or something. Or if it's just passing it through, like you can just read the file and pass it through as like a as a fake file, basically. Yeah. Okay. But down the road, that will be confined in some yeah, some way. Yeah. 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 It will be locked down. Yeah. Okay. So, All right. Yeah. 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 <coughs> I didn't get ISD either. Any other question? Good, not good. Makes sense. So if you, I think they can roll seven when they release it. They're gonna uh, win over uh, Black Hat and all that. I don't know what Black Hat. Yeah, they're, they're, they're gonna be sent to carry like everything else. You know, you remember last year Black Hat? They tried to break into a KVM. They tried to break out of a KVM virtual machine. They tried like hell though. So I'm sure the same thing will happen to Docker. But the good thing is if they keep trying, then.